there's corruption in this city, lurking on every back street and alley like a sick cat. Hello, my name's Mike Stalker. I'm a private detective, and I've worked on some pretty unusual cases. Before the case I'm about to recount for you is through, one victim lies dead, murdered at the Mission Rock. get to see the seamy side of people in this business. One of the most bizarre cases to come my way involved a screwy dame who wanted me to find her missing. Well, maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. My troubles actually started at the racetrack, where I put in my share of afternoons playing the horses. Ordinarily, I've got a good nose for the winners. But this time I was suckered by a screwball tip that Glue Boy was a lock in the fifth race. After Glue Boy lost his win coming around the stretch, I'd blown 50 bucks to the track. But that wasn't what was bothering me. I still owed my bookie a couple of G's, and I'd been counting on Glue Boy's 30 to 1 odds to put me back in the chips and pay off my debt. I decided to keep a low profile for a while until I could scrape together the dough. I deployed to the Mission Rock Resort. This was one place where my credit was still good and the Irish coffees were strong. Since I hadn't had lunch, I was glad that Irish coffees contained all four major food groups. Caffeine, sugar, fat, and alcohol. Fortunately, the place wasn't too crowded, so at least I could unwind a little. Alone, soak in the view and try to sort things out. I retreated to my favorite spot over the water. Even the shipyards were lovely. My spirits seemed to be improving. You can imagine my horror when I spy that slimy bookie and his trained gorilla walking in the joint. I'm not usually taken aback by unscheduled meetings, but this didn't seem to be the right time to discuss business. I tried to dodge them. Nevertheless, they had no trouble tracking me down. There was not much to discuss. After a little haggling, they agreed to give me six more days to pay up, otherwise I was dog meat. But I'd been in tougher spots before. Early the next day, I stopped by my office to see what the mail offered. Quite frankly, work had been a little scarce lately, and today the post office wasn't cooperating. To make matters worse, I had a hangover that was making me feel like part of my brain was missing. What I needed was some walk-in business. A client with an expensive problem. I smelled the cheap perfume even before I heard the click of her high heels walking down the hall. By the time she walked in the door, the room smelled like backstage at Big Al's on a Saturday night. This gal was definitely trouble, but this wasn't the time to be choosy about clients. I asked how I could assist her. She said her name was Bernice and she was missing a necklace of genuine pearls. She was told it was worth $23,000. She wanted it back. This case required the strictest confidence. The pearls had been a gift from her husband a violently jealous man who would never forgive her if he found out the necklace was missing. She was sure he would kill her if he found out she was having an affair. The last time she remembered seeing her necklace was also the last time she was with her lover, Emil. Emil hadn't been answering his phone, but she was sure he would never have taken the pearls. He was so kind, so sweet. The photo she showed me didn't leave me with much doubt about this character, so this was lover boy. Bernice didn't even blink when I told her my fee was $500 plus expenses. She reached into her purse like a kid going for popcorn at the pictures. I jotted down the address of Loverboy's apartment.
Within a short while, I was headed to the Tenderloin to investigate Romeo's residence, a flea bag hotel. After years as a professional snoop, I had cultivated a nose for slime. You might call it intuition. Something in the photo she gave me suggested that I wouldn't need to look much further than her lover to find Bernice's precious jewels. As I walked through the lobby of this rundown flop house, I was fortunate enough to run into a neighbor of his, a nice home-cooked dish. It was the work of a moment for me to get some information out of her about little Emile's whereabouts. She could keep a secret as well as Herb Kane. The way her eyes lit up when I mentioned this guy showed that her feelings for him were more than neighborly. She'd just seen him leaving, with his suitcase, ten minutes earlier, and he had mentioned something about family troubles in L.A. Although she was giving me the eye, I had to turn down her enticing offer for a hot cup of coffee. I wasted no time and headed for the train station a few blocks away. I arrived just in time to witness the little weasel slipping onto a train for L.A., but unfortunately I was too late to stop him. It was clear to me that this yo-yo had no more family in L.A. than I did. Once in L.A., he'd be about as hard to find as a baby pigeon. Maybe I hadn't recovered the jewels, but I had caught this clown splitting town, and this in itself was a job well done. This low-class con man had obviously used Bernice and then robbed her. Would she be willing to face the facts? I procrastinated a few hours from the slippery task of easing the bad news to her, but the dirty job had to be done. Unpleasantness is what I am paid for. It wasn't enjoyable for me to tell Bernice that her boyfriend had split town and that it appeared that her expensive necklace was gone with him. Her reaction was predictable. She took it like a woman. And I decided it would be best to get off the phone and talk to her when she had cooled off a little. Bernice called the next day, not much calmer.